Welcome, 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 welcome. All of you lovely people out there. How is everyone doing? There are people here, so you better answer me. Of course, people started disappearing when I came on screen. I guess they were disappointed. <laughs> I guess they were disappointed. They, I, I guess I wasn't wasn't good looking enough when I showed up. I'll have to, have to go try a face mask or something next time. I right? should just throw that on, on on camera. Can you? If you guys can hear me through this, maybe this would improve. If anyone out there, anyone out there has a bane fetish, maybe I can I can work with you on that. No. <laughs> Yeah. Steve, you are born on a pair of skis or something. <laughs> I'm not going to do the Bane voice, though. That's where, that's where things cut off. I don't do impressions. I'm not good at impressions. <laughs> Never have been. You're at a ski condo now. <laughs> How does a guy who runs a free free message board end up at a ski condo? Got to figure that one out. I'm going to start a free message board. <laughs> Wife is successful. Well, she's got to be supporting a bum like you. Lazing about in Hawaiian shirts all day. Uh, ah, do I have any update to my plans on smoking cigarettes in a French graveyard? Uh, no, just not soon enough. Not soon enough. Not soon enough. There's no such thing as soon enough when it comes to that, is there? Every every second you wait is just too long. It's too long. Sooner the better, though. Still trying to get that all figured out. Suppose I could call an immigration lawyer, right? <laughs> Still like, look, here's what I do. Here's what I want to do. Here's why I can only do this in France. Because you're the only place that has uh, the proper brand of cigarettes and French graveyards. And all I want to do is, is work from home, not bother anybody, and contribute a lot of money to local bars and restaurants and, and tobacco shops. That's it. I will be an ideal French citizen. I mean, I'll be quiet. My kids, not so much. I'll be quiet. But I think, I think that I think I would I, like. Aside from like being pro probably like mentally incapable <laughs> of learning French, I would. <laughs> I would be an ideal French citizen. whole travel ban thing might have yeah you know that's a little that's a little unfortunate but you know uh hopefully a small travel ban now will result in less of a travel ban in the future or at least like let me just get there and then ban travel <laughs> let me get there and then travel screw it i'll figure out uh, I'll figure out how to SQL Server in French. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know what? That's how. You know what? That's how I'll learn French. That's how I'll learn French. I'm gonna learn it from SQL Server error messages. So in SQL Server, there's a view, right? We can do. Oops. <laughs> uh, from sys dot messages. And it's, oops, I'm going to start off hitting the right button. And it's usually a good good idea. And if we look in sys.messages, we'll see all sorts of, I mean, there's all sorts of text over here from the messages that you can get in, from SQL Server, right? So what's any, does anyone know the language ID for French offhand? I'm, I'm fine. Go, go look it up. All right, go figure out SQL Server language ID French. 10... 36. Ooh la la. <laughs> As the French say. So let's see where. Oops. 
Steve, can you please fix SQL prompt? <laughs> How would I have a with there? Where language ID equals 1036. Let's run this. Let's get, oh, this is how I'm going to learn French. Check this out. I have all of the SQL Server error messages in French. Now you need text-to-speech. I do. I do. I need text-to-speech and speech-to-text because I find that one of the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles I have to writing is typos. And... <laughs> And like I'm like I think I spend more time going back and fixing things than I do uh, actually writing. It's Duolingo. My wife does. My wife has been doing Duolingo in French, with French specifically for like two years now, and she and Duolingo is still giving her nonsense stuff like the uh, like the men are rich and calm or like the men ate all the strawberries. Or like the cat is black. It's just like the same stuff. Like 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 just going like she's regular with it too every single day, and just like nothing, like like no real advancement after a certain point. So I'm gonna I'm gonna learn it from SQL Server error messages, and I am gonna blow her out of the water. They prefix they come. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, the colon prefix does not correspond with the table name um <laughs> uh, okay so apparently uh what i need to do is figure out a way to have the language ids alternate <laughs> and um what i'll do is let's see <laughs> in six and let's say uh, order by, I'm on, message ID, and let's see. Uh, well, you know, it'll have to be message ID and then language ID. Will that work? No, because that's going to order that first. If you just order by message ID, it should give us that. Let's see if that works. No. No. It didn't work. 102. Is it... Did I miss something? Did I get something terribly wrong? <laughs> Randomly would be funny, right? 1033. Why is language ID 10... Oh, duh. Why didn't anyone yell at me? 1036. I had that all wrong. There we go. Now we got it. Ah, we got it. See, I was off by one on that. Off by one. It set the whole thing off. All right. Now we got it. This is great. Morning. So, aver, 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 advertisement. Can anyone help me with the pronunciation there? <laughs> Note the error in time and contact your system administrator. Note the error and the error in time and contract your system administrator. Well, no, you see, it, numerically I was off by one, but physically I was off on the keyboard by one, by, by 80. I was off by, numerically by 80, but on the keyboard I was off by one. So I wanted 1036, and I ended up with what, 2016? So I was off by one on the left hand. That just screwed everything up. Screwed up everything. But yeah, this is great. So th I, you know, I figured I have a plan now. I have a plan. Column prefix does not match with the T. This is great. Yes, I'm going to contact everybody. Query not allowed in wait for. Ooh, request. <laughs> this is awesome. This is truly awesome. Oh, this is gonna be fun. I have a plan now. I've always I was I was wondering how I was gonna spend my summer vacation, and now I know how I'm gonna spend my summer vacation. This is great. So let's uh let's talk about this query tuning thing. Now I've got a I've got a store procedure with two statements in it. I'm gonna run one at compat level one forty. 
you should sort by language ID? No, if I sort by language ID, then it's going to be all the 1033s first. I want them to be interspersed like this, ordering by message ID, so that I can see the English version and then the French version. No, I don't want both. Both would screw it up, because then I'd have all the 1033s first. This way it works. Message 101, message 102, message 103. If I, if I have it by... When, if, I, if I sort by language ID, then 1033 will sort first, and then all the 1036s will come later, and I want them together so I can see the translation. It's a terrible idea, Mr. Pshaw. I'm ashamed of you. I'm ashamed of you. Mm, no, you're not getting it. It's okay. It's okay. All right. So uh, let's look at uh, this thing here. Right, we got one query up here that's going to run a compat level 140. One query here that's going to run a compat level 150. And let's go look at what happens when we execute these. So, just to be extra short, let's recompile and let's get that going. Let's run this. Run, the, run this. All right, we're on. The, we're on to something else now. Go talk about order by some. Go talk about order with yourself. I don't want to talk about this anymore. We're on to the query tuning bits. So let's look at these two query plans. They both end up pretty quick. All right, if we look at these, this finishes very quickly, and this finishes very quickly. Good, good, good. We have a sort here, and we have a sort here, and everything is generally pretty dandy with these sorts. But then if we go and run this, and we look for a different number in, for the gap, Right, we're going to supply a different gap parameter. We're going to go from 9 here to 0 here. We're going to keep post type ID at 1, though. And if we run this, the row mode that's going to be the compat level 140 is still going to be pretty quick. But we're going to have a real problem with compat level 150. You can see that this thing is kind of still over. Well, that, 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 that executed it for a little while there. Right? That, that gave us about 10 seconds total of execution time. If we look at the query plans now, this is going to be the row mode plan. This, was, this is going to be the one that executed in compat level 140. And if we look at the sort, it's going to spill a little bit, right? Now, knowing what we know about row mode plans, and knowing what we know about reading execution plans with these times in them, this operator went for, uh, uh, this operator ran for about 256 milliseconds, and the next one ran for what 1.253 milliseconds, but it's a little bit under a second because 253, because the 1.253 minus 25.256 is going to bring us to about a second. Because remember, in row mode plans, operator times are cumulative. Cumulative. All right. So this is actually just running for about a second, and the spill isn't that bad. Spill level two, one thread. All right. About 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 a little bit less than ten thousand pages ended up on disk. So I'm totally okay with this. This did actually pretty good considering. This sort is going to continue to be in row mode because we were looking at it in compat level 140. Compat level 140 doesn't allow batch mode for row store. Compat level 150 does. At least if you're nice enough to pay for enterprise edition or smart enough to just use developer edition instead. Don't tell the licensing don't tell the licensing police I said that, but you know, all the smart kids are doing that. So now we have this section of the plan, which is pretty okay, but looking down here, this is where things all of a sudden got bad. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Wow, I got spam. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Gamer. 2018. Why don't you update your nickname, nerd? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Jeez. So this is, since these two operators run in batch mode, all right, that's a batch. And even though the storage is row store, since this is compat level 150, we're able to buy, or we're, we're able to buy, <laughs> we're able to batch, run this in batch mode. Uh, we're able to run this in buy mode because we bought Enterprise Edition. And apparently, we bought followers, primes, and views because we're fame. We want to be famous. I wish I could get famous. Apparently, Mr. Gamer left, made fun of his nickname too much.
But now this sort, since, th since these two operators are in batch mode, right? We can see batch a batch mode here, and we can see a batch mode, oh, tooltip, you weren't working with me there. We can see a batch mode here. <sighs> since th these two things run in batch mode, this, this is interesting, right? Since these two things run in batch mode, the, the times are no longer cumulative. The times are per operator. So this sort really did run for nine, almost, let's just call it 9.3 seconds. This index seek was very fast, but this sort was very slow. Now, there's a funny quirk with sorts in batch mode. It doesn't apply here. It, it applies to parallel sorts in batch mode, where the output from them is single-threaded. The batch can run multi-threaded, but the output from a batch mode sort is single-threaded, unless they're the child operator of a window aggregate. We don't have one of those here. We also have a serial plan here, so it doesn't matter. Everything's on one thread anyway. But this single-threaded batch mode operator, well, it's a kind of funny. Isn't that kind of funny? Spill level 8, and it only wrote 5,142 pages to disk. So if we go look at the memory for these two queries, this one here got about a, got about a, a meg of memory. That's 1,024 KB. So we got about a meg of memory here, and with that one meg of memory, we still had to spill out a little bit, but we spilled out about close to 10,000 pages, but this happened pretty quickly. This happened in about a second. The batch mode plan gets just about five and a half, well, let's just call it five and a half megs of memory. That's close to 5.4, and 5.4 is pretty close to 5.5. So we'll just stick with this. So we get about a 5.5 meg memory grant here. We spill out, but man, this operator runs for nine seconds. Nine seconds. And it spills about half as many pages. Now, what a lot of people will do when they start trying to tune queries is they, they might care very much about wait stats. Newer versions of SQL Server have wait stats in query plans, which, is, which, can, which can sometimes be helpful. They can sometimes find things in there. For the query that runs quickly, though, well, we have about 260 milliseconds of I.O. completion. Right? That's fine for a query that ran for a second. We don't we don't know what we did for the other second, <laughs> but we know but we know that we had two hundred and sixty milliseconds of I.O. completion. That's the only weight that's stored in this query plan. For the query that runs in batch mode, well this this gets even more curious. If we go to the properties over here and we look at weight stats, well, <laughs> we only have twenty four milliseconds of one weight. Reserved memory allocation EXT. This is not a terribly helpful weight. See, one of the real dark sides of uh, some of the things that Microsoft adds is that they, they, they decide to filter things out for you. They decide what you see and what you don't see in some of these additions to help you troubleshoot problems. The thing is, Having that, t knowing that this query waited 25 milliseconds on reserved memory allocation EXT is not going to help us figure out what's wrong with this query. But neither would looking at what we actually waited on. So let's look at wait stats using my store procedure SP thunderous underscore. Look at that. Look at this thunderous underscore. Look at that thing. That'll buckle the knees. Uh, human events. And we'll use it to look at weight stats. Uh, Lee says, I'm slowly learning the answer to every SQL question is, it depends. Yes, but the important thing for every SQL question is knowing what it depends on. Because if you know what it depends on, then you can solve the problem. Yes, the, the, the answer to most things is it depends, but the secret is knowing what it depends on. Knowing those dependencies is where one gains expertise. Depends on what. You got it. You got it. That's the bumper sticker, isn't it? So we're going to use SP underscore human events. We're going to look at wait stats for this one session, right? So we're going to focus this one session, and we're going to we're going to we're going to get some information out of this. Now, the funny, like the the thing with with these is that if we look at the wait stats for 
the fast ones, right? If we look at the wait stats for this, there's going to be just nothing in there, right? We didn't generate a single thing that made us get a wait, even for like the the other pl even for like the the plan in 150. We don't have really anything of interest in here, right? There's nothing about wait stats in here, blah 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 blah. Not fun. Not fun at all. Doesn't really help us. So let's go and let's use sp underscore human events. We'll kick this off and we'll come over here and run this and we'll wait for these queries to finish again. All right, so that first one finishes quickly. We're probably not going to see much. We're not going to see much for interesting weights there. And well, this other one is going to execute. And this one's actually going to take a little bit longer now. Right? That that was it was like nine point something seconds before. It's at ten point one seconds now. So this sort actually did a little bit, a little bit more work on this one. Actually, no, it did about the same. It just took longer. <laughs> <laughs> I oh I hate you. So using SP human events, we get um, we get information about query weights at three different levels, right? And this is because I do a whole lot of work in my store procedure to give you this data at three different levels. For the entire time that it ran, we had uh, we for the total weights we had nine hundred and ninety nine weights on this mysterious sleep task weight. Hmm. Hmm. And then at the database level, well, the only database that was active because this is this is just my personal computer. This isn't. This of course is not Stack Overflow's production database. This is just my personal laptop. So there was only one database active. That was Stack Overflow 2013. But that'll report that we had the 999 weights and that we waited 8.2 seconds on them. Now. The other thing that I, I try to break down with human events is to give you weights by query and database. So we can look at we can look at things, you know, overall by database, then by query and database. And we get, of course, some information here. Oops, I did not hit the right button. So we get the query text and the query plan of the queries that generated the weights. Right? We can see there what happened to it. Now, since this is two statements in one store procedure, we unfortunately get the query plan for the whole store procedure. Um, I'm working on something to make this better, but I, I don't quite have it yet. So I'm working on something to focus this in. It's almost there, but it needs a little bit more work. So we at least see the query that caused the weights. We still do not, we, since this is a plan that comes from the plan cache, we don't get the actual plan. If extended events were better, if extended events were a tool that Microsoft cared about us using and using happily, we would be able to chain things together. We would be able to say, hey, extended events, I want you to fire off this event if this other condition meets like whatever I want. So let's say that, you know, for us, we, we cared dearly, dearly, near and dear to our hearts. We cared. Well, I mean, I care about learning learning French from error messages, but let's say that we cared nearly and dearly uh, about queries that were waiting on sleep task weights. What I would like to be able to tell extended events is, hey, if you find a query that waits on sleep task, go grab the, collect the actual execution plan for it. We can't do that together. We have not extended events that far into the future. We cannot chain events together. We cannot chain sequences of events together. And that's a pretty big gaping hole in extended events. I'm not saying Profiler is any better at it that you can go get that magically from Profiler. I'm just saying if, if Microsoft really wanted extended events to be helpful and usable, they might want to invest some time in like, you know, getting people to actually use it by making it more useful. I don't know. Just me. Just me. I'm not angling for a job as the PM of extended events or anything. That would be a nightmare because it's all XML. <laughs> and I've seen it and it's ugly. But um, this is one of those things where it's just like, you, like, like if you build it, they will come. Like Microsoft like, like built like a, like a really, really crappy. It was like not a field of dreams. It was like a, like a, a field of, uh, I don't know. Not, not quite. Actually, you know what? Maybe it is a field of nightmares because of the, the amount of XML. So um, I wish that I could like chain things together to get something different. But unfortunately, if I was going to do this and get wait stats and query plans, I would have to collect actual plans all the time. And that just wouldn't be, wouldn't be a lot of fun because then I'd be collecting wait stats and ex actual execution plans rather than being able to chain things together and you know be able to only get actual plans after like some other like like extended event condition 
got got like past the filter. So I have the estimated plan for the query that ran. And we can see that's the store procedure. And we know from looking at the actual plan that this sort ran for a long time. But you know, this is this is this is probably a pretty good lesson in and of itself. Um, how can you track just one store? Eunice, you can read the documentation because <laughs> it is in there. <laughs> there is an object name filter in there. You can track just one procedure. Um, that doesn't apply to every single one because not every single one gives you the ability to track just one store procedure. You can only do that if you're tracking queries. For wait stats, uh, actually for wait stats, I think you can do something. I forget exactly what. It's in the document. I wrote the documentation so I wouldn't have to remember all this stuff. Uh, but if we look at the estimated plans, all right, and this is sort of a good lesson about estimated plans general, cache plans in general. If I told you I had a query running for 10 seconds, it would be very, very difficult to ascertain if each query ran for five seconds or if one query like, like we have runs for about a second and another query runs for like 10 seconds. You can go to my website. Uh, it's a good place to start. It's all there. Uh, so if we look at these two uh, estimated plans, we can kind of get a feeling. Estimated plans lie to you. Estimated plans hide a lot of things. Estimated plans hide a lot of things because they are only estimates. This is what goes in the plan cache. This is what goes in the query store. This is what you get from like any like any tool, unless it's like like unless it's specifically saying I am collecting an actual post post execution plan. I cannot get like the level of detail that you, that you are after. If we look at like a few, sm few small differences here, like if we look at this sort for in the estimated plan, we have estimates for everything, right? We have estimates for all of these things. Estimated execution mode, operator cost, IO cost, you can read all those things. If we go back and look at the actual plan for it, all right, oops, not that one, is it? <laughs> oh, I have two versions of that open. We don't need two. We just need one. If I go back and look at the actual plan for this, we get actual values. We get what the query encountered when it executed for a bunch of things, right? We get actuals for this. Uh, we get actuals for this. Uh, we get, well, this, is, does, is, this isn't prefixed with actual, but this is an actual, right? We get the actual execution mode. We get actuals for many things. One set of values in here that we don't get actuals for are costs. See all those costs? There's no actual cost that gets updated at the end. There's no actual cost addition to operators, to query plans, where SQL Server says, oh, I was totally off about how long this would take. I was totally off about these costs. My bad. I'll go fix that. We don't get that kind of like... Um, we don't get that kind of honesty from SQL Server. All we get is SQL Server saying, well, I estimated that. <laughs> if I was wrong, I was wrong. My bad, my bad. I was merely speculating. But what's important here is that when you run into a situation either where SQL Server was wrong or where you have been parameter sniffed, you end up with stuff like this, where we know that this sort ran for 10 seconds, but the cost is merely 1%. If we were if we were trying to, if we were looking at this query and saying, geez, costs are super important, let's try to figure out where SQL Server spent all the time, we would look at this completely innocent index seek and say, wow, you are half the cost. How do I make an index seek faster? Bad idea. Don't look at costs. They're lies. They're lies because costs are not about your server. Costing is a general algorithm that has no idea about your hardware, how awesome your disks are, the great gobs of memory you have, any of that stuff. Costs have nothing to do with you. Costing is a general algorithm that has to apply well to everybody, regardless of how good or bad their hardware is. It just so happens that SQL Server's optimizer is very good at coming up with general plans in general across a, like a wide variety of hardware, but they are still not specific to you. That's why there is no actual for op for costs in an, in an execution plan. SQL Server doesn't go back and correct those costs, nor does it attempt to cache plans with those costs. Right? We can see that the, the cost for all this stuff, well, 86% in an index seek. Dear Lord, we need to make that seek faster. 
What a terrible time. What a terrible thing that we have to do. What a terrible thing that we are tasked with. And look at the actual plan. How long did this thing that cost 85% run for? 0.001 milliseconds. How much did this thing that cost 55% run for? 0.002 milliseconds. How long did this thing that cost 2% run for? 1.5 seconds. It gets worse down here where this thing that cost 1% runs for 9.9 .9 seconds. SQL Server. SQL Server. Uh, I wonder if all of the data in Azure, if they'll be using machine learning to correct cost estimates. No, because the cost estimates still have to work across a wide variety of Azure machines, too. I mean, I, I, Azure, a, Azure is not, a, not one size fits all. As Azure, in Azure, you can get a server with less than one core. I think you get a hyper-threaded thread in that case but you can get an Azure server with less than one core. And the costing would still have to respect that. I mean, you would only be able to get like a serial plan for that because you would have, like SQL Server probably not going to say, we got half a core. It would probably, probably round up and say we have one core. So um, probably not um, because, you know, even, even if they did that, uh, even if they did that for the current gen of Azure machines, think about in like five years or 10 years or even in one year, what different, Azure machines we would have, what kind of hardware might be behind them. You know, you start adding in like all, all sorts of like weird, cool new features and you start adding in stuff like persistent memory and all of a sudden, what do we get? Much, much more difficult to figure out what something would cost and all that. Coyote McD says, why do the percentages add up to more than 100% in that particular plan? Because <sighs> SSMS is broken. Because costing is broken. Everything is broken. The world trembles beneath us, and we have no idea what holds it up. We have no idea. Uh, so, yeah, we have, we have this thing. We have this thing, and we're not really sure what's going on. But what, what, what I want to show you here is that this is, of course, happening in batch mode. And this is, is going poorly in batch mode. So in the interest of, of full disclosure. SQL Server 2019 has this lovely mechanism for giving queries feedback about memory grants between executions. If we run this a second time, they'll both be fast. Right? So SQL Server has adjusted the memory here. We have gotten more memory on this execution and this sort no longer spills and we no longer we no longer have a big old spill here. The problem becomes, really, if we, if we run this query a few more times, then memory will eventually adjust back down. Not for that one, but for this one. Memor the memory grant on this one is back down to 2.3 megs now. And if we run this query, it's going to start spilling again, because the memory grant will have adjusted down to compensate for needing less memory. And this will run for, I don't know, 10 seconds again? 8, 9, there goes 10 seconds. And look what we got back to Spillsville, and back to a bad memory grant for this thing. Uh, Super Siberial says, would Sentry 1 Plan Explorer report correct percent values compared to SSMS? Uh, I, I know they do some correction to it. Um, uh, let's look. Let's see what happens. Uh, 0.3... 1.3. So yeah, it looks like the costs are different in these. So that's, let's go, let's see here. Uh, this is the first statement in there. This is 0.3, 1.3, 60, 38.4. And if we go back to SSMS, there we got uh, 0 to 85, 55. So yeah, uh, Plan Explorer does report correct percentages. Uh, how would force parameterization affect this? Um, affect what exactly? Uh, everything is parameterized. This is parameterized. This is parameterized. I don't, I don't know what you would expect force parameterization to affect. We have force parameterization by actually parameterizing things. We have we have nothing that we we have nothing that is not parameterized. So we have we have got that. So the the problem with memory grant feedback is that it can be a bit schizophrenic. If you have queries that really do like vary uh, back and forth constantly, then 
well, you know, if we look at this, we can go in the execution plan, we can go to the properties, and we can see, come on, tooltip, don't go over where I'm trying to look. We can look at the memory grant info, and we can see, uh, oh, where is it? No, you're not hiding there. <laughs> where are you hiding? Why are you not in there? Am I losing my mind? Am I losing my mind? No. I think I'm losing my mind. I think I might be. Oh no, because that's the two. Ha ha ha! That's why. That's the that's the op, that's the 2017 plan. If we look at memory grant info for the 2019 plan, I knew I was off by something. Uh, we have this info, and we have this information here about uh, memory grant feedback adjusting going back and forth. Lee Brownhill says, I've stopped using Plan Explorer unless it's a monster plan I'm looking at. I don't know where so many items are within PE. Uh, so you're, I think you're right. Um, plan Explorer is not good at showing some things. Um, but Plan Explorer is absolutely masterful in showing you um, the query plans for long stored procedures. Like just because uh, you know we have a stored procedure here with two statements in it, it's very difficult to navigate stored procedure like statements within a big stored procedure using SSMS. But with Plan Explorer, you, like you just you can't beat this. If SSMS had this, I think people people would stop using Plan Explorer completely. It's just. <laughs> It, it's a, it's just like it's a magnificent feature it's a magnificent feature for that but you know um for uh so like the other the other thing is that um as like if so like we brought an actual execution plan into plan explorer right we have the duration we have the cpu but we don't have the per operator times in here like we have in ssms right it's just not in there now if now we can get it if we go and get an actual plan Come on, dummy. Okay, fine, whatever. It's not going to let me do it. But if we went and got an actual plan from Plan Explorer, then it would show us operator times. But right now, we don't see the operator times here. We can get it if we measure it with Plan Explorer. But if, like, if, we, have a, if we have an execution plan like this one that has operator times in it for us, then that doesn't import into Plan Explorer. So you can get it from Plan Explorer, but you can't get uh you can't you don't just get it natively which is kind of a downside can't you add that no you can't add that um no right click and copy yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not dealing with it right now <laughs> i don't feel like dealing with it uh so let's get back to the the query at hand here let's figure out what 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 could we say about this query? What could we say about this that would help people trying to look at issues with moving to SQL Server 2019? Maybe they're seeing some weird query regressions. Maybe things are just not going so well for them. Well, we could generally say that, you know, we have to beware of regressions when going from row mode to batch mode, right? If we Again, if we, we, we backtrack a little bit for the for the people who showed up late, ungrateful, rude people who showed up late. When this query executes in row mode, everything kind of goes okay for it, right? Like maybe not like perfect, right? But maybe, but, but but pretty okay. We have this sort of, uh, uh, operates in row mode, runs for runs for about a second. It spills a little, but you know, like not like like I don't I'm not one of those people who. Um, I'm not one of those people who, uh, you know, um, f like fixates on every single spill in an execution plan. You know, sometimes spills are just going to happen. They're not, does, they're not always the gigantic performance degradation that people worry about. But this spill is. This batch mode spill ends up being far, far worse than if we have the spill happen in row mode. And what's, I mean, so like just to kind of go back and like, you know, make sure that everyone understands, the row mode spill spills about 10,000 pages and runs for about a second. The batch mode spill spills half as many pages. Let me get that tooltip fo focused in correctly. 
<laughs> just finished cooking my family. Was it a pizza? Because I saw that pizza. I saw that pizza, and that pizza looked good. The batch mode spill uh, runs for like ten, like nine seconds here. Uh, goes to spill level eight, <laughs> which which means that we had to read data from the spill eight times. But it spilled half as many pages, so we can't even necessarily say you might see bigger spills in SQL Server 2019, and that might cause a problem. You could say that smaller spills in SQL Server 2019, if they happen in batch mode, could be a problem. But how could you reasonably ask someone to measure that? You could say that batch mode sorts are something you have to be careful of. But I think a lot of what I would... Fish pizza? Good lord. Monster. Uh, but I think a lot of what I would, I would, you know, maybe go and warn people about with batch mode sorts would be stuff like, you know, uh, they, 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 don't, they output data in a, si in a single threaded, even if they run in parallel. TempDB activity increase. So, Lee, the spill was smaller. Right? Like, I'm, like, I'm not sure what activity you would measure to, 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 to get it to see an increase. Right? We have a smaller spill here. So we might even see less of it. It's just it's curious because like how do you t how do you how do you tell people what to do, what to look for, what to deal with? You might be able to tell them that they you know if they're seeing a big uptick in sleep task weights, that they could have something on their hands. But you know, the problem here is also that sleep task is not just for sp for like spills at all like this it's not just for that <sighs> it's quite strange it's quite strange so uh lisa's i didn't know fish pizza was a thing i wish i didn't so I, I would say the one thing the one place i would i would be okay with fish pizza one of the best one of the best things i've ever had was indian pizza it was just like a big piece of naan with basically just piled with Indian food on it. And one of them, there was like a tandoori fish one, and it was excellent. Probably excellent because there was no cheese involved. One, like, I don't know if you ever watched a cooking show. Once you involve cheese and fish, you're in trouble. Cheese and fish should not be on a plate together. That's not a kosher thing. That's just like a, a human thing. Like, just to, please do not have cheese and fish cohabitate. It's like... like you you would have to be such a magnificent chef to make that work, <laughs> but like one of the one of the best things I ever had was a tandoori fish pizza, knocked my socks off. I I, I lost my mind over it. It was fantastic. I forget I forget what else was on it, but holy cow, that was good. That was good. So like you get like t like say, say say SQL Server 2019, you could like ask for an uptick. You could like say well if you see like some queries slowing down and you see like an uptick in sleep task weights, maybe that, but oh, but man, that's a tough thing to measure. And like I was saying, sleep task weights don't only account for sort spills. They can also account for hash spills. They can also account for anything that the people at SQL Server are too lazy to put in a definite compartment. Sleep task is just like saying, <laughs> it's, like, it's almost worse than the miscellaneous weight. It's almost worse than that. So what could we tell people to do here? What could we tell people to be aware of? What could we tell people that would help them fix this? Because what we have is uh, a sort that SQL Server is using to optimize this nested loops join. He says, I see a lot of sleep task weights on Azure when restoring databases. Well, you know, you're, it's probably just a sign that your databases are really boring. Sorry to say, you need more exciting data. You're putting your, you are putting your computer to sleep, Lee. Spice things up a little bit. <laughs> Get something interesting in there. Stop having dull data. So this is, uh, this is kind of a known thing too. This is not, this is not a new thing. So if you look at SQL Server, um, let's let's look at, look look the fellow up by name, Craig Friedman, Optimize IO. Nested loops. Uh, is it going to be in this one? Maybe it's in this one. Oh, no, that's Paul White. <laughs> Paul, how did you steal Craig's blog? 
<laughs> Mr. P shows his data. Bam, take your data. Yes, emerald that stuff. Emerald your data. Uh, Lee Brown Hill says, I'm guessing as well as copying the replicas. And yes, yes, yes. Production DBA activities are very boring. They are very boring. Now, where is this darn blog post? Why are you hiding from me, Craig? Why are you hiding from me? Let's let me let me go look over here because I know we have it. Let's just go right to the root of Craig's blog because then we can, then, we, then we can find it. Then we can find it very easily. So, SQL Server has a whole bunch of things built in to the optimizer that can help it. Uh, that can help help it like optimize certain activities. One activity that uh, is a, a frequently used optimization is putting data into order. Oftentimes, if we don't have an index that puts data in the right order, or we just use a different index than the index that has data in the order we would want it in, we can end up with SQL Server saying, you know, I'm going to sort this. I'm going to sort this for you. We're going to get this all sorted out for you. So a SQL Server can, uh, has a number of things that it can do. And you, I'll, I'll stick these links into chat so everyone has them. Operating, uh, optimizing I.O. by sorting, part one. Part two, it's a two-parter. It's that exciting. I wish Craig Friedman would come back. He works on all sorts of weird NoSQL stuff these days. But what Craig will talk, Craig talks about in these blog posts is uh, things that are built into SQL. And th these blog posts are not new. These are not spring chickens, but these are still things that happen and exist inside SQL Server that, you know, that can contribute to um, you know, any, anything that you see in an execution plan today. This is SQL Server 2019 that I'm running these demos on. You still see the same stuff happening. You still see SQL Server's optimizer costing things, doing things the exact same way. It's crazy. G. D'Onofrio says, Today I had a transaction log corrupted, sorted out, but with heartache. Yes, that would give me heartache too. That would give me a lot of indigestion. I, I hate stuff like that. That is not the type of problem I like solving. <laughs> I do not like that because they are heartache problems. They are truly heartache problems. They are not problems that have that often have a happy ending to them, right? It's like it's like putting down a dog. <laughs> like there is no happy ending when it comes to that. It's terrible. But uh, these two blog posts, very good. Actually, the entirety of Craig's blog is pretty awesome. I would, ex I would suggest reading it. Again, even though it's not the newest material in the world, it is all still relevant. It is all still absolutely relevant. Everything he talks about in here is stuff that you can see happening in query optimization today. So let's close out of here because apparently we don't, we don't need this anymore. But so we see SQL Server sorting data, putting things in the right order to make this nested loops go faster. And if we look at what we're sorting, right, let's see. All right. So we can see what SQL Server is doing. Uh, Craig is still at Microsoft. He's just working on NoSQL stuff now. Craig is just working on other things now. Just not working at, not working on SQL Server stuff apparently. That I know of. That I know of. At least he, he stopped like writing and blocking about SQL Server. So I assume he went on to do other stuff. And I know, traitor. What can you say though? What can you say? Maybe, maybe he did the right thing. Maybe he got out at the right time. Maybe he got out at the right time. Maybe he got out just when he should have. <laughs> Maybe he said, SQL Server is a mistake. I need to go work on something else. <laughs> I wouldn't blame him. I wouldn't blame him. SQL Server is a tough one. So we have sort of an interesting thing here where let's say that we had written this query in a very specific way because it solved a very specific problem in SQL Server prior to 2019. Right, we have uh, for a small amount of data, this runs very quickly. Now let's let's do this let's do this backwards. Let's run this for a large amount of data first. When we run this for a large amount of data first, we end up with a parallel plan for both of these. All right, and if we look at the properties of this, and we look at the number of rows, we can see that we we have some spread here. Maybe not the greatest, 
most equal, evenly balanced spread in the world. But that is going to be different if we look at this. SQL Server is solid, old, 40-year-old technology that, yes, <laughs> built on the legacy of Sybase. Built on the legacy of Sybase. Oh, did this end up? So, uh, yeah, so this is where things get a little bit interesting. Um, if we think back, let me actually backtrack a little bit so that I can I make sure everyone's on the same page. When we run this for a, uh, a small amount of data first, right? This second execution plan that has the sort in batch mode and has the seek in batch mode, right? These both occur in batch mode, right? Even like batch mode for row store, that whole thing. So it, for, for some reason, for a very small amount of data, SQL Server is like, throw the batch mode at it. If we recompile this and we say, hey, let's do this for a big amount of data, SQL Server is just like, uh, batch mode, not so much, not so much. The seek is still in batch mode, but SQL Server is just like, I, I, I don't want a batch mode to sort there. Right? And we're not going to see batch mode at all here because we're having this query up here is executing in, in, uh, in 2017 compatibility mode. So. When this goes parallel, SQL Server is, is all of a sudden like, ah, I know it's not going to be good. I know it's not. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. It's not, it's not my jam. Not my jam. Has the thread count spread improved? Well, let's go look. Not really. It's about this. It's about the same. Like the, you see the threads end up on different rows. So Lee, uh, you should know this from yesterday. Uh, with because you 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 have Joe's post on how the on how on how rows are assigned to threads via hash algorithm, so you should like these like we're getting the same rows and they're going to end up hashing out right so the the spread isn't going to really improve here it's going to be a little bit different. What if we Itzik began hacked with a fake cons? Would that be well? It's already in batch mode. Right? We already have batch mode on row store. We don't we don't necessarily need uh, Itzik's trick with a fake column store index or Nico's trick with a, a temp table that has a column store index on it that's empty. We don't really need either one of those. We get batch mode on row store here. Batch mode so batch mode sorts have very specific issues where um, like I was said I said earlier I'm not sure if you caught it or not but batch mode sorts. Um, output data single threaded from whatever data comes in. So that can cause problems in a, in a parallel plan, right? So like unless they're the child operator of a window aggregate, then they can, then they can output in and they can output data on parallel threads, but otherwise they're kind of stuck outputting data um, on a single thread and that's no good. <laughs> the Joe posts are a weekend reading. They're pretty heavy for my little head. Yes, uh, Joe Joe's head is, like he is mega mind. <laughs> Joe Joe's 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 head is fantastically large. It's got all that brain in it. But now what gets what's interesting here is if we you know we can run this multiple times and this will this will end up being rel pretty fast, right? Just without uh, just avoiding that batch mode sort. And if we run this for the for the small amount of data, this will be reliably fast too. So one one, one wonders a little bit with SQL Server 2019 is if they start seeing uh, those sort of batch mode sorts, like, well, would you want to force a parallel plan? Would forcing a parallel plan ca like cause SQL Server to change its mind about those batch mode sorts? Like what, what could we really tell, like what, what, is, what is a good call to action for all this? Like what will we tell people to look for? What will we tell people that we really need to, we really need them to get ahead of here? And it's sort of a tough, qu it's a tough question because it's a tough problem. Right? Because like if, if we happen to run these plans and sniff them for a large amount of data, we don't run into the same problems that we do when we when they run and we sniff them for a small amount of data. I'm not saying this is always going to be the case, of course. There are times when a big plan would be terrible. Uh, Lee asked, would CX packet weights change dramatically? I'm not sure what you mean, because the serial plans won't have any CX packet weights, and the parallel plans are, of course, fast, and we're probably not all that consumed with CX packet weights when parallel queries are running quickly, 
So if we look at the weight stats over here, figure out which one CX packet was. We're not gonna see CX consumer, of course, but we have that on the first one and on the second one, I would be surprised if it was much different because they both finish in a pretty, pretty close amount of time. Uh, CX packet. Oh, okay, yeah, a little bit more then. A little bit more. But probably not enough that I'm I'm terribly concerned about it, right? Because it's a it's a hundred millisecond difference between one and two. If if I mean sure, absolutely. If you know you have, let's see, let's run this. Let's see if we can. Let's see if it's still. So here's an interesting one too is the sort for the, the fully row mode plan will never adjust because we're in compat level 140, but the sort for the compat level 150 plan where we end up with the some batch mode operators, that will that will adjust the memory grant over here, and we will eventually get rid of the sort. And when we eventually get rid of the sort, we end up with a faster execution plan, right? Not, by, not like, holy cow, we really beat the pants off it, but, you know, we, we do get rid of the sort. We do alleviate the sort there, and we do have just about the same CX packet weights across both of them now. So 361 there, and it should be just about the same here too, 369. So CX packet weights aren't gonna change dramatically. Um, I've gotten away from looking at weight stats for the most part on servers. Um, they can be helpful at a high level to help you understand if there are any major bottlenecks, but when tuning a single query, um, I, I've, I've never found weight stats terribly helpful. And today's a pretty good example of that. Like when we looked at weight stats specifically for that query when it spilled, we got 8.2 seconds of sleep task. And what the hell can you tell someone to do about sleep task weights? What can you really tell people to do? There's not a lot. There's just not a lot that you can tell people that, like that's actionable about sleep tasks. Like watch out for spills. People are already watching out for spills. People are already have their eyes peeled for spills. That's one of those things that people focus on. Why did this spill 10 pages? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so eliminate the sort and bam, the problem is gone. The problem is that if we eliminate the sort here, all right, so we're ordering by score descending here. If we eliminate the sort here, how do we only get the top 500 rows into the app? If we take the top out, how many rows do we get back? And do we want to send all of those rows to the app and then have SQL Server sort that? So let's go... Let's actually just experiment, right? Why not? Let's take the top out of these. So we're no longer going to get the top 500 here. And we're no longer going to ask for uh, any ordering here. We're just going to say SQL Server, go off, do your thing, return all the rows. How do we get only f like the top 500 rows in the order we want into the application if we don't do it in SQL Server? This returns not too many rows for the first one, but we know that because this is a pretty big gap, right? So this returns 4,000 rows, this returns 4,000 rows. But now, if we do this for a, a big a big chunk of gap, we're gonna go from 4,000 rows to a whole lot more rows. What if we added a range one to 500 filter? Range based on what? <laughs> but we could generate a row number but then we would have to generate a row number over the entire set and we would have to s we would have to generate that row number based on an, some ordering element and that ordering element would have a sort in it if you want if you want if you want to, if you want the uh, behavior of top your options are to use top or to use offset fetch which are pretty pretty much commensurate uh, within SQL Server, or your option is to generate a row number and only get that only uh, include rows where the filter of that on that row number matches like what what we want to send back. But if you want that row number to be ordered in a meaningful way, so that we actually get the top 500 rows based on score, we need to order by score in the row number which means that we're going to have to sort score to put it in to get the row number in the right order. That doesn't help us either. We still need to order data in order to create that range. So if you run this for a big chunk of data, well, I mean, we're not doing any better here, right? This one finished. 
and then this one here is still going. Oh wait, no, it finished. So this took a minute and a half. This this returned 1.7 million rows. This put this returned 1.7 million rows. Sure, we're no longer putting data in order, but we are running for a pretty long time, and we have now shoveled 1.7 million rows into the application. And we have now we're going to ask the application to just cut down on four. So just to show you what I mean, we, we no longer have the order by here, but let's say we wanted to get things, we wanted, we wanted to generate a, like the, the row number over score anyway. And we say row number over order by p dot score descending as n. Now we can't use this uh, in the where clause directly. So we would have to make two changes to this query. We would have to not only add the row number here, but we would then have to either select, we'd have to turn this into a derived table, right? And say, select star from and do this as X where, oops, Steve, fix this thing. Oh, why did you do all that? You are crazy. Is x where x dot uh, n? Let's just do just to just to have it done between one and five hundred. So we would have to use as a CTE. CTEs are garbage. Stop stop relying on CTEs. Would it be possible to have an index on score to prevent the sorting? Yes, it would be possible to have an index on score to prevent the sorting, but. Um, that might mess up other stuff. And we do have an index currently on the table. Um, it, does, it, it does have a uh, score or in the include, so it's not in order. Why is CTE garbage? Because they don't do anything useful. They don't fence off queries. They don't materialize data. They're just useless. They're just like having a view or a derived table or anything else. They're not good. They're just not good. Uh, they, they don't help you do anything better. So let's also do select star from this is x where x dot n between uh, 1 and 500. So yes, we could change the index to have score in order, but then that would that we would have to disrupt the key columns of the index and if other queries use this index, if you know just think of think of like all the all of the pain, that can come from changing key column order in an index. Because remember, key column order matters. Included column you can have in whatever order you want. But if you have uh, key columns set up in a, in a specific way, there is a um, there is a column to column dependency between from you know from owner user ID to the diff to post type ID. If we st if we put score here, right? Oops. Let's if we put score here or if we put score at the very beginning, we would disrupt queries. We would disrupt queries being able to go across. That's a lot of records for a temp table maybe. Yeah, 1.7 could be a lot for a temp table. Uh, it could also be a lot to stick into an application server because those things are always just murder boxes anyway. So like we could change it, we could think about changing the index or adding a different index, but you know, um, we would have to be very sure that if we were going to disrupt the order of columns in, in the key of the index, that it was for a very, 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 very good reason. Because who knows what crazy legacy application stuff is is like needs the index in this order. We could also add a new index that maybe helps things out, but then we would have to be very sure that that new index wouldn't cause any regressions across other queries, and also that that new index um, would actually get used by our query. Now, I haven't gone down that path of adding a different index and seeing if, if it gets used. I'm willing to do that here, but, you know, um, let's just see what happens when we run this with a row number first. Zane says, <laughs> it's more of a created... Z so, Zane, you are almost right. It's not an abstraction. It's a distraction. <laughs> it is a complete distraction. <laughs> and you know what? We'll We'll talk about... Uh, why CTEs are silly too. What about a column store index? What about a column store index? Tell me what about one. 
if you're going to throw the kitchen sink at me, we are going to have to ask why. So when we generate a row number over p.score, we also end up sorting for it here. All right. So this will not help us tremendously, I would wager. I would wager this would not help us tremendously because we're still going to have that big old sort. Now, Kelly, if you're suggesting a column store index in order to get batch mode, we're on SQL Server 2019, and we already get batch mode for row store, which we've talked about a little bit here. I'm not sure if maybe you, maybe you got distracted by CTEs and walked away from the webcast for a little bit, but we already have, oops, we already have batch mode going on in here, right? So adding a column store index would not necessarily help us get around any of these problems. And he said, Zane's been drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Zane loves Kool-Aid, I hear. But since we had a question about it, let's look at why CTEs are stupid. Where CTEs are stupid. Of course, I, of course I misspell stupid, right? Let's just say we select top one from users. Oh, we'll not write that old style top. We want to have the new style top in here. And since, since Andy is here, we need to take sort very seriously. The sort is now batch. You have been, you, if you have been paying attention, you would have seen that right the entire time. The sort has been batch mode the entire time we've been talking about it. The, the sort only wasn't in batch mode when it was parallel. The sort was batch mode the entire rest of the time. We need to work on your concentration skills. So let's select the top one, u.id, and let's capitalize things properly so that our friends our friends in the, oh, we didn't even capitalize that properly, so that our friends in the case-sensitive server department do not get angry. And let's just say where uh, ID equals 22656. Cool. Uh, I've forgotten as there. There we go. Now we're all sorted out, but you didn't capitalize properly either. SQL prompt is broken today. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I <laughs> recognize I'm a delegate for the new style top delegation. Yes. Those new style tops. Good. Hopefully someday. Hopefully someday I'll be able to make it. So with just running the query inside of the CTE, we have one seek to the users table, right? And if we look at the results that we get back from there, we will just have this one column called ID. Now, if we say select star from CTEs are stupid, and let's say as C1, we will still get the same execution plan. Et voila, we still have one seek into users. But now let's go and join CTEs are stupid as C2 on that ID column. And you know what? We don't even need to get things from other places. C1.star. All right, and we look at this and we say CTEs are stupid. And now we look at the execution plan. We have two seeks into the users table. We no longer have just one. And if we go ahead and say join CTEs are stupid as C3 on, and I, like, I, don't, I don't care what we do here. Should I do it on C3.id equals C2.id or C3.id equals C1.id? I'm fine doing either one. You tell me which. Whoever, whoever answers first, I'm going to do what you say. <laughs> we need an Eric Blood Pressure Gauge widget on Twitch. Uh, you know... <sighs> this is cathartic for me. C3 equals C1. Okay. C3 equals C1 here. C3 dot ID equals C1 dot ID. And if we now run this, because CTEs are stupid, we are now going to have three seeks into the users table. CTEs are not fun. They are not good for you. If I add another one, just, just, just because I want you to see it, if we join this as C4, all right, we go the extra step out of the mile here on. Let's just go back to C1 dot ID equals C4 dot ID. This will get a fourth seek into users. So generally, re-referencing CTEs, 
Re-referencing ZTE will not is not your friend. <laughs> Karen says, "Man, I need my dev team to watch this desperately." Ah, uh, good news, good news, Camaro. I do developer training. If you would like your developers to learn this and be able to ask questions, then boy, oh boy, we can certainly do that. So a CTE would not help us much more here. And just to go, and you know, I'm going to leave this as is, so I don't have to undo a bunch of stuff. But leave this as is. This is going to be the exact same thing uh, as before. So if we run this, remember, remember, remember carefully. This execution plan, this sort was always in batch mode. The only time this sort comes out of batch mode is when SQL Server says, oh, you know what? Oh, you know what? I would like to run this in parallel. And when it runs in parallel, well, that's when things things get interesting. Now, what kind of sucks about this is that we don't get a window aggregate function here. I was I was half worried that we would get a window aggregate function but we don't. Screw you, SQL Server 2019. You are not my friend. <laughs> You're not my friend. Anyway. Anyway, so what could we tell people to do here? Like what would be what would be what would be the takeaway? Like, we still have this query, we gotta figure out what to do. Like I don't know. The same thing happens if you use table joins. I don't know what that means. Alternative, no, subqueries have to execute all that syntax too. If you want a stable result set, use a temp table. Use a real table. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's all you have to worry about. So the, just remember that the query inside the CTE is not materialized anywhere. The results aren't materialized. The, um, the expressions aren't materialized. Uh, anytime you re-reference that CTE, you need to re-execute re the query inside of that. And when you, that means you can do a whole lot of extra work. So like something like rejoining the CTE to itself would also would mess things up tremendously. But if you repeat a subquery, then repeating a subquery will also re-execute the syntax. But it doesn't really get you anything. It doesn't really get you anything. It's unfortunate. It is quite unfortunate. Sounds like a connect item. <laughs> um, I guess. The thing is, if you if you if you were to materialize a CTE in any meaningful way, then you would need to account for what happens, uh, where that data gets materialized. Um, do you put it in TempDB? Do you have a local store for things like that per database? Um, how do you manage? How do you ma manage concurrency there? How do you manage rollbacks there? How do you manage, you know, space taken up by these things? How do you manage, like, you know, the inevitable, um, uh, the inevitable, like, uh, concurrency issues that come from all whole bunch of different queries now trying to use space? Right, so like you know, yeah. So like, yeah. And Zane brings up a good point that you know we don't know what to do there. We don't know what's right or wrong there. So it would it would be up to users to, or it would be up to Microsoft to give us a hint, like option materialize CTE or whatever. And it would be up to us to add that and use it there, which still doesn't help people who are on third party vendor apps where they can't change the code. And you know. Um, that hint would probably only be on, you know, v next of SQL Server, so it might not even help people going back all that far. And, you know, it's just sort of, it's sort of like you add it, but at the same time, if you're going to add a hint to materialize a CTE, why not just add a temp table? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, like, if, we, if you started doing that automatically, if you started automatically materializing CTEs in TempDB, you would be in trouble. The only thing I could think of that might make that tolerable is if you used something related to accelerated database recovery where you used like a local persistent version store to materialize CTEs instead. It's the only thing I could think of that would be like neutral ground that would like really help that out. That would, that would, that would like have any like, like not <laughs> like user, user crazifying um, problems with it. And like, then like, you know, you would have the, you would have to have the query hint. You would have to have the database setting. You would have to have 
uh, like probably not a server level setting. Server level setting would be dangerous, but like you'd have to have the query hint, the database scope configuration, um, probably a trace flag, then a whole bunch of stuff to like turn it off, to disable it. And like, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work when people like to add all those hint, like hints and settings and everything. When really, if you just use a temp table, you would probably get the equivalent experience of whatever Microsoft would do to materialize a CTE. Like, like I get, I get that people really want this, this magic thing, but like <laughs> Microsoft doesn't have a good record of like, like, like applying any like Disney magic to new, to new things. So you would probably just get like a new thing that, that is just standing on the shoulders of a bunch of very old things. <laughs> like it just wouldn't, <laughs> like, I don't think like, there's no way to pan that, to have that pan out for free. Right. Like there's no way. <laughs> There's no way for Microsoft to implement materialized CTEs without <laughs> without um, just like using a like a temp table behind us. <laughs> Zane says Sierra attempts to fix people's scalar value. Yes, yes. Like if like if you want to see something very funny, like people people got all wound up about um, about table variables, right? But if you ever look at a table variable. Um, all right, we don't even need to put anything in it. Uh, oh, I forgot the word table though. Nuclear T table. There we go. Well, that didn't go well. This isn't my SQL. There's no back ticks there. And then we say select star from T and let's set statistics IO on. All right, and we <laughs> we look at this. You know, this is this is just gonna have a temp table behind it anyway. So like everything Microsoft does, that people are like, it's magic, it's fixed, it's in memory, we did it. Microsoft f f solved all the problems. It's not. It's just, it's everything is backed by a temp table. Everything is tempdb. What no one understands is it, it tempdb all the way down. Tempdb is the turtles of Microsoft SQL Server. I hope someone from the Tiger team watches your channel. I'm pretty sure they only watch my channel to print out new things to put on their dartboards. <laughs> Yes. Yes, the villain is TempDB all along. If you use a temp table with three, th uh, no, no. Um, so here's the difference. Uh, and what's a good way, what's a better way to show it? So let's say that our query is a little bit more uh, complex, right? CTEs are stupid. So with the, the trivial example I gave you, yes. It would not be a big deal. But let's say it was um, users ID where u.id equals 22656. And now let's do join posts on p.owner user ID equals u.id. And now let's join uh, badges on B dot user ID equals U dot ID. So n now we have a little bit more going on in here. And the same thing will happen if we look at this and if we run from as C1, right? If we do this, the same basic thing will happen. Except now as we add references to the CTE in there, equals c2.id. Now, as we get things a little bit more complicated, we start to really see the repetition in the query plan being crappy, right? And if we add a third one in, right, we're going to see that, that we're going to see that branch come in again, right? So as c3 on uh, c1.id equals, oops, equals c3.id. Right? So now we have a third branch of that. So what I, what I mean when I say CTEs are garbage is because people, what, what does everyone say about a CTE? It makes my code so much more readable. <laughs> what do they end up jamming inside a CTE? That 5,000 line monster nonsense query that has like a filter on the outside based on like the four most compu complicated calculations inside of the CTE. And they they think that like they have performed some active like just magic magic performance wizardry 
by sticking this thing in it. Like all of a sudden, this query that is like like the hottest garbage on the hottest day of the year, like like uh, like buried ten feet down on Venus, is is like magically safe and wonderful because it's in a CT. It's readable and understandable now because I said with before I wrote this 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 this, this query. <sighs> So people tend to put very complicated things inside of common table expressions. And when you do that and you start repeating yourself, where you touch things from the common table expressions, where you touch the code inside it multiple times, you start ending up with these repetitions in your query plans. And so what I mean by use a, use a temp table instead is if you just said, oops. And then we said, here, you would only have to execute that first branch once, and then you would have, well, yes, you would have to hit the, hit the tables to do the self-join. You don't need to expand all of these joins over and over again. So like that's, that's really what I'm getting at, is because people jam the worst things in CTEs, and they're just like, well, I'll just make it, it just fixes it. Right? So if, like for putting a single query in there, not a big deal, right? But if you have big complex things in there and you end up needing to execute that big complex thing over and over again, you're in tough shape. You are not, you are not in good shape. So anyway, anyway. <laughs> ah, this went, this went a little bit, went a little bit further off than I thought it would. Kind of funny, but. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. So uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I do want to thank everyone for coming in, hanging out, uh, watching me kick this queer. I am going to post. I am. I am going to have a blog post about this. Yes, they do create a testy Eric. <laughs> and um, what you know, just while we're here, as a thank you for showing up, I have two more dates for my. Um, I have two more dates for my online uh, performance tuning class, Friday, July 10th and July 24th. Um, if you, as a thank you for showing up, there should be floating above my head a coupon code that will give you, get you 75 bucks off the, the, the cost of the one day training. If you want, feel like buying a ticket, you can go over there. And if you sign up and buy a ticket, then you get all of, you get all of the videos uh, on my my video train, it's like it's like it's a good 24 25 hours of performance tuning videos that I have available up on my site. Um, you get all of those for free if you buy a ticket to the class. Uh, you get those for life. You do not they do not have an expiration date. Uh, Gene Arfio says do it. It is far worth all the bucks. Thank you. Uh, Gene Arfio was in the uh, class that I had last week. Um, so he 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 is a he is a valid unpaid witness to the things that you will learn in the performance tuning class. And he says, Eric puts a coupon code above his head so he can flex when he points to it. I wish that I had anything left to flex. I wish I had anything that I could flex. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I have not been to a gym now since like March 5th, 7th, somewhere in there. I forget exactly when. I have nothing left to flex. There's zero flex left in me. Like I can, I'm really good at flexing my mouse click finger, but that is, that is about the end of it. That is about the end of it. I have like very good mouse click muscles. I have nothing else, nothing else. I have nothing left to flex. I'm going to have to work on that eventually. <laughs> I'm going to have to either move to a state where gyms are open or buy a house in a state where I can afford a house a and put a gym in, in the basement or garage or something. That's like my only choices. Is your city on lockdown? Yes, I am in New York City, so we still do not have gyms open. Seagull says, agreed. Class and video sets are legit. Highly recommended. Yes, thank you, Zane. And he says, eight ounce Chateauneuf de Pop curls. All of the Chateauneuf de Pop that I own is currently in my mother's basement getting ready to, um, to, to go to the summer retreat. NYC epicenter. Yes. <laughs> NYC did not did not do so well. <laughs> yes. Did not. Brought to you by Canada Dry. I wish 
If Canada Dry sponsored me, I would be so happy. They are one of my favorite seltzers. And if they sponsored me, they would be my absolute favorite seltzer. Right now, it's between them and Polar. They are the only seltzers that have strong enough bubbles that, that, that like get, get on the tongue and make it hurt a little bit. Yeah, Texas and Florida not, not doing so hot now. But, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully they get things figured out. <laughs> hopefully things get figured out. I want to see everyone going back to a happy and healthy world. That's, that's what I'm after. Let's see. Do you ever use one of those soda streams? No. There's the soda. No. Um, so I've had friends who had soda streams, and uh, they did not have very good luck with them. They found that the bubbles did not last very long. Um, and that they could not get things quite as bubbly as they wanted to. I have very, very high expectations for bubbles. I have very high expectations for bubbles. I want strong, I want like aggressive bubbles. I want little, aggre like scrubber bubbles for my tongue. I want like, get in there. Get in there. So I've not, I, I've not heard a review of Soda Streams that seems to indicate that we could that I could get the kind of bubbles I want out of out of a soda stream. But if someone has if someone can can point me to how you get the strongest possible fizz into a bottle. Let's see. Okay, but you're better off getting a classic soda gun, then you can just use standard CO2 and load it up. I do that for tonic water, jack rudy syrup, then spray this wow. It gets very carbonated. Uh, let's see. Is there a good time to put questions into chat during the demos? I always feel I ruin the flow of the point you're trying to make, but the delay on the chat doesn't help. No, just whenever. Um, if I'm if I'm in the middle of something com like like that, I really really want to finish talking about, then I'll finish talking about it before answering the question. I'm totally fine with questions showing up whenever. Uh, I like I like I like having things show up over my head. I like having things show up over my head because it lets lets people know that people are here. <laughs> when, when they see people are here and active, then they're they're more more prone to being here and active too. And I like I like having things be here and active. I want someone to run SP who is active and just see an ASCII image of me pop up. Like, we're here, doing it. Because that's what's fun, right? Being here, doing stuff, talking to people. Talking to people who I wouldn't get to see every day anyway. You know? uh, I'm very, very grateful to be able to do these, to you know, have sort of a, a setup that works, and, and people who show up regularly to watch me do goofy things. It's nice. It's nice. It's nice. I enjoy it. I enjoy having a bit of an audience. All right. Any other questions? Anything else you all want to talk about, ask about, feel... inclined to know more about be happy to answer something be happy to answer something let's see stream setup is great thank you arthur um hopefully hopefully it stays that way hopefully i don't end up like looking sad and outdated <laughs> too soon he says, I'm still adjusting to SQL people streaming seem to happen all at once. Uh, well, I mean, it's just sort of circumstances, right? <laughs> like, like, what else is there to do? <laughs> like, you just, if, you don't, if you don't hop on board, you're, you're going you're gonna to miss out. If you don't stream, like, what, what are you left with? You're like, you know, uh, you, you kind of end up with, you know, the same people doing the same stuff. You know, some people might, might just blog occasionally. Some people might blog constantly well i mean this does get recorded too this all ends up on youtube you know i still record i still record stuff just you know i'd rather i'd rather go live and talk to people than just talk to a camera i spent jeez i spent 48 hours <laughs> talking to a camera to get the uh, the first round of recorded stuff in and i felt insane at the end of it cuz it was just like like 3 or 4 days straight of me recording things and just talking to a camera. And while it's nice to, you know, be able to like stop and do over if you makes like make a mistake or flub something up, well, still just, still just talking to yourself. Uh, no, no mentions of that. So thank you, Lee. 
There's been nothing of the sort. Nothing about hats. <laughs> We're all grateful for, for a lack of hat talk. We're all grateful to not have to address hat hats. <laughs> Uh, good times. All right. So it's been like an hour and a half. Um, wait a minute. <laughs> if you have a condition like this and field one modulus number equals uh, number service. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, so it's going to depend a little bit on, on where it's happening. So like, let's say like... Let's say that you have a query like select count from users where, um, let's say, u dot reputation modulus 11 equals uh, zero. All right, run this. I mean, this is relatively fast because there's not a lot of data in there. And we get like a not great guess here, but like what's even, oops, not seeing SSMS. Nope. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I knew it was there somewhere. All right. So let's just change that. Let's just say modulus two equals zero. Count. This comes back pretty quick. And, you know, we make sort of a crappy guess here, right? We make it, we were off by a bit in the guess. We're going to have to read every row in the table because right now we don't have an index on reputation. But let's do something so we can figure out. Let's do something a little bit different. Let's um, say and u dot id equals 1. Actually, let's do. I know. Actually, no, let's do 22656 because I know that's going to come back with something. So here. We get a very bad guess, and we end up scanning the entire clustered index because that's all we that's our only option. But if we change this a little bit, now we have an index seek because we're seeking into the ID column, and the residual predicate on reputation just really doesn't make a difference. So it really depends on what indexes you have, what other predicates you have, and what else is going on in the query. People make a really, really big deal out of sargability. No, you're looking at my SSMS now. Um, so I, I, I verified that you're looking at my SSMS because that is, that is what Streamlabs tells me. So uh, it really depends on where the lack of sargability is happening. So like if, it's, if we have you know, an index, or rather if we have a query like this and we're able to filter, we're able to seek earlier on, right? We're able to seek to where ID equals zero. Then the predicate over here on that, on that, that, that sucks, that's not sargable on the reputation column doesn't make as big a difference. If we were to say something like, uh, let's see, what other tables are in the post table? What else could we do in there? Select top 10 from users. What other columns do we have in there that might be interesting? Let's say, um, and display name like, uh, well, A, all right? Well, actually, let's make sure that we have our case, sensitiv case sensitivity worked out. So now we don't have an index that's helpful, right? So we're back to scanning this thing. If we create some indexes, right? Let's create index whatever on users. Let's do this one on reputation. And then display name, and then we'll do one on the in the opposite direction afterwards. Oops, I didn't create that. I just went right back to the query, didn't I? All right. So now with the leading column being the crappy predicate, right? We're, we're we have to scan that index, right? So that's not so great there. But if we change the order of the index columns now. Because we're we're only doing a trailing wildcard sort on display name, uh, it's not going to be it's going to be okay-ish. But now we're able to seek to the A's that we care about, and the the residual predicate on 
reputation isn't that big of a deal anymore. Right? So we have the seek predicate down there, and then the other one is just not that great. So, yeah, Andy's right. As long as, you know, that's not a variable, as long as it's a literal value, then you could totally, um, you could totally create a computed column to get around something like that. Um, it's a, like, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like weird logic to me though, anyway, like, like why does a number... Why does the modulus math of a number have to equal something in order for it to be <laughs> to like qualify for the It's like a very weird set of logic. I think it's a very odd set of logic, but you know, I'm gonna try not to kink shame anyone here. I don't like kink shaming because I have so many issues. But yeah, you know, the um, computed columns are a very good way to get around that. And then if you can't, uh, if you know, if you don't have a computer column data around that, then you know, sargability really matters most when it affects the leading column of an index. If you have good predicates on other columns and they lead in the index, then having the non-sargable predicate on a, on a column that's uh, on a key column that's later in the index, um, because it's it like it just you you're able to seek to other things first, and you're able to get an early row reduction first, and it just makes a, a less of a difference. Uh, let's see. And he says, we did exactly this because the app developers do <laughs> ID modulus 10 to split work into 10 work queues. <laughs> Yay, app developers. They see squirrels everywhere. <laughs> Mr. P. Shaw says, if reputation modulus 1 was the only predicate, could you get the right query better or is it just going to be bad? So the only way to do it would be um, something like Andy mentioned. You would have to alter table users. Oops. Add... Call, add uh, chuckles as uh, reputation modulus one, and you might want to do some or int just to make sure things turn out the way you want it. And you don't have to persist it, but you would have to index it just like any other column. You would have to index it in order for things to turn out well. So. Uh, let's, ha, 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 ha. I'm having a good time typing, drop, come on, dummy, <laughs> drop indexes, get rid of all the indexes. So with this column added, but not indexed, we're going to, when we, you know, we're going to have to compute the scalar at some point. We're going to have to scan the clustered index to get in there, right? We're still going to have that crappy predicate on there, but at least SQL Server will be smart enough to say, hey, if you add an index to that column, we'll be in better shape. So now if we actually just, no, you know, screw it, let's just take the missing index request. Because in, th in this case, SQL Server is not wrong in its missing index requestness. Right? We add this index on our computed column and display name, SQL Server is able to index. Uh, let's see, a uh, couple of questions here. If vendors table and code and we can't alter the table, then we're just stuck. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, like unless the vendor is, yeah, but if the, you know, if the vendor is any kind of reasonable vendor, then making that change is not a problem. Uh, is the drop index proc available? I've seen Brent, uh, yes, you can find it on Brent's site. Uh, but now if we have an index on chuckles and display name, we are able to seek to that predicate on chuckles without anything. So computed columns can be, be very, very useful. It can almost be very, can, uh, computed columns can be very useful in these cases, but just like regular columns, they're not, they don't really reach their full potential until they are indexed. So if you have computed columns, that's great, but you know, whatever. Anyway, uh, we're gonna call it here because I I need to I'm I'm gonna start doing a dance soon and it's not 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 the good kind of dance, uh, so I'm gonna call it a stream here. Thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, I will probably be back tomorrow to do what I don't know yet. I'm gonna have to make something up today, but I will see you all back tomorrow. Thanks for joining. Um, remember, if you want to join me for a full day of performance tuning stuff. You can go to, I'm sorry that my arm gets cut off. You can go to one of those URLs that I am pointing to. <laughs> and you can use that coupon code up there in order to get 75 bucks off. So you get 
a full day of performance tuning training with me and then access to all like 25 hours of my recorded videos. So it's quite a deal. Quite a deal. Thanks, and I'll see you back tomorrow.